So Dehancer is a DaVinci Resolve Final Cut Pro After Effects and Premiere plugin. What it does is it emulates film styles, and there's 60 plus film styles to choose from, including three other print styles. So you can not only like replicate the film on it, but you can replicate the paper that it's printed on. Uh, it is a pretty useful color grading tool, so I'm going to go ahead and dive in and show you guys just how useful it can be. Now, I will say I've had Dehancer for about a month, and I've used it on quite a few projects now. Uh, it's very useful. It helps to kind of uh, streamline my workflow a little bit, but I don't feel that it's anything that I couldn't do with DaVinci. But where I think it's, it's the most useful and valuable is that it saves me quite a bit of time. Now, to state, I'm not a professional colorist. I am primarily a wedding videographer and content creator, so I don't have experience in like the cinema field or anything like that. So I do think it's useful more for people like that. If you're a professional colorist or anything like that, you're going to get these tools in DaVinci Resolve and probably be able to use them a lot more efficiently. But if you are somewhere in the field like I am as a wedding videographer, commercial videographer, um, content creator, anything like that, you get some really, really cool looks out of these. So let's go ahead and dive in and I'll show you what it looks like. So before we get into the meat and potatoes of this, I am using a few different variations of footage here. The first one that we're going to look at, which I'm going to pull up now, is on the Fujifilm, and it's a fairly controlled lighting environment. It's inside one of my offices. With the Dehancer plugin, there's a few different ways that you can do the Rec. 709 conversion. Um, option number one is if you go into the Film Emulations tab, it's going to have Dehancer Pro. You're going to drag that onto your footage. And let's disable everything here. So... Right out of bat, these are all going to be disabled. Um, I was editing some footage, so those were, you know, converted already. But you're going to go up to Source, Choose Camera, select what brand your camera is, and then as you can see, there's a list of cameras here. Unfortunately, this was shot on the XS20, and we don't have that. So we're going to go back and put this back into Rec. 709 color space. And then we are going to drag our F log F gamut to 709. So now we're working in the 709 color space. From there, you can do like your exposure compensation, um, temperature compensation, things like that. I do like my footage to be a little bit warmer, so we're going to push that just a little bit. Uh, tint compensation, this is going to be your maroon and greens, and it looks pretty good right out of gate here. Actually, we might push that a little bit into the maroon. Uh, Defringing, honestly, haven't quite figured out what that does yet, so not sure that it's really necessary. And then your next tab is going to be your film that it's shot on. So there's a wide list of films here, um, everything from Adox, Agfa, uh, a few different Cinestills. The most notable are your Fuji films, your Ilfords, and your Kodaks. Uh, but there are some other like Polaroids, Lomachromes, little stuff like that. Most people are going to stay in either the Fuji film or the Kodak spaces. Um, so let's play around with these a little bit. So Ektachrome, we know that Ektachrome is a pretty good landscape uh, film. And as is Ektar. Now, Ektar does pull a little bit towards the maroon side, so you might have to balance that a little bit. But there's a wide variety of different films here. Now, what's cool with these is you're going to be able to kind of like emulate film looks from different cinema. So if you know that a movie was shot on a certain type of film, you'll be able to kind of replicate that. And if you've used Shot Deck, you'll know that there's a wide variety of films that uh, cinema can be shot on. I have a tendency with all of the work that I've been doing with this to lean kind of towards the Kodaks. Um, I do prefer a warmer look with most of the stuff that I do. So Kodak Gold has been a lovely one. Um, not sure why it's pulling so green on that, but... We can adjust that. Um, let's stick with 
let's go with a portrait because this is kind of a portrait. So we're going to push that tint compensation. And then you're going to go into your developer. So developer is going to give you things like your contrast boost. And that's what's really going to make your subject stand out. Uh, gamma correction, different color separation. And I use, usually leave the color separation turned all the way up just because I, you're going to want that. Uh, color boost is going to pretty much be your saturation slider. Um, I think it looks fine set to zero, but you can push that a little bit if you want things to pop a little bit more. Then next tab is going to be film compression. So film compression is going to help with your highlights. So as you can see at zero, my highlights are a little bit blown out. If you push it all the way up to 100, it does bring those highlights back down a little bit. And we're going to actually go back and play with some more of these films just to show you just how many there are. And for sake of showing you what they look like, I am going to just dial these back, all back to zero. Ooh, Pro 400H looks pretty good on this. So there's different prints and stuff like that too. Can still do the black and whites, which is pretty cool. Now I do think the Fujifilm XS20 does lean a little bit into its greens anyway, as most Fujifilms do. Um, their old films were kind of similar to that. So no surprise on that. Um, let's go through some of these Kodaks. I know a lot of people use the Kodak Visions. Uh, 250D seems to be the most common for like outdoor shooting. And then the T's for tungsten are going to be some of the more common when you're shooting indoors. So let's go ahead and stick with the 200T just for sake of uh, why not, right? I'm going to push that exposure up a little bit. We are going to come back down here, add a little bit more contrast, correct this gamma just a little bit, and then pull our white point down. So the white point um, operates kind of inversely. Uh, the higher you push your white point, the lower your whites are going to be exposed. Tonal range, um, that's going to be just kind of how flat the image looks. We're going to leave that at 30. Um, add some color density. So the color density is going to also help with like separation of colors. Expand is going to be your black and white points. So as you crank your black point up, it's going to give you more contrast. As you crank it down, it's going to flatten out and crush your blacks. We'll leave that at zero. And then same with the white point, just opposite. You see you can completely blow out your highlights or you can completely crush them. I like leaving a little bit of highlights. I think it adds some depth in there. And then it does have a luma mode and a normal mode. I've not really messed with that too much. The interesting one to me is prints. So if you're in linear, it's just going to leave it pretty much be. You can also do your Cineon film log uh, color space transformation inside Dehancer. But I really like the way that Kodak Endura Glossy looks. So this is going to be essentially the paper that your film would have been printed onto. So there is a Fujifilm print. Let's show off what these look like here. I forgot to click the enable button. So there's your Cineon film log. There's your linear. And then Fujifilm. Kodak 28, 80, or 2383 print film. And then your glossy paper. I just, I really like the way the glossy paper looks. So that's pretty much what I've used for everything that I've done. Um, you can do a direct contrast adjustment on the print paper. Adjust your color density on here as well. And then you get into the fun stuff. So, color head's going to be essentially your color grading per se. Uh, I do think color grading is more efficient in DaVinci Resolve itself, not using the plugin. So, if you do need to do like some uh, balancing of skin tones and stuff like that, I would add a node prior to and then go into your mid-tones and push your, your orange or whatever color you like to push into your mid-tones. Same thing with like your shadows, if you're going to push a little bit of blue into your shadows or teal or something like that. Um, along with your highlights, you can adjust your offset in there, which if you're here, you probably already know how to use DaVinci Resolve, so I won't go too deep into that. Um, this is more of your, your top coat. So 
the fun stuff is where you add in the film grain. Now, I will say, we know that you can get film grain with DaVinci Resolve. And it does a pretty good job of it. I think the film grain from Dehancer is a little bit more palatable and believable. So there's all different types, um, from 8mm all the way up to 65mm. I tend to stick to the 35mm ISO 50. It's just enough to be noticeable, but not so much that it's gross looking. Um, unless you're going for like a really stylized look, so, you know, that's an option as well. Uh, and I do crank my amount down just a little bit. So I'm going to pull this up and let you kind of see what we're working with right here. You can see I'm a little bit blown out on my right cheek there, but that's because I was kind of greasy. It was a long day at work and I was sweating already. But I think it does give a really good look. And to say that you couldn't achieve this in DaVinci, I would be lying. But I do think it's it gives you some complexities and intricacies that are a lot easier to achieve through Dehancer. So let's back out. And then we're going to add in our halation. So that halation is going to add a little bit of warmth to our highlights. That typical, like, kind of red fringing. Something cool with the halation is that you can run it as if it has a rem jet or no rem jet. Um, now, the technicalities of that, I'm not 100% sure. I do shoot film, but I don't develop my own film. So I have a guy that does that for me. His name's Zach. And he's probably one of the most... Uh, technical film developers I've ever known. He knows way more than I do, so I just pass everything along to him. So, we'll go ahead and do Super 35 on 35 millimeter, and then we're gonna crank the amplification down a little bit, just down to like 50. And that's where that leaves us right there. So as you can see, there's off, and there's on. So it does a pretty believable job of the halation as well. Like I said, I really like the looks that come out of this. So we're going to go in and add the bloom now. And this is something I do pretty much on every video anyway. Uh, I don't like a super, super clean look. Just not my style. So we're going to push the amplification up on that because we don't have a lot of like overexposed highlights. And then we're going to go ahead down to 16 millimeter and let that do its magic. And then there is also film damage on here. So you can add film damage, film breath, film gate. Um, not things that I typically use. Uh, I just think that that's kind of gimmicky, but they do serve a purpose in some iterations of videos. So that's what that film damage is going to look like there. We'll blow that up full screen for you. And again, it's believable. Um, it's not overly digital looking or anything like that. Just not my preferred thing. Film breath. And I'm not a thousand percent sure exactly what this does, I do believe it's kind of your breathing on focus. So you can see it kind of added like a little bit of flicker almost. Now that's going to be, you know, if you want to shoot like a quick like 30 second intro on a wedding video or something like that, it could be usable. Not something you're going to want to look at all the time. Um, it can be kind of distracting. Now on the 35 millimeter, that, that first one was 8 millimeter. On the 35 millimeter, it's a lot more subtle and believable. So I don't hate it on here. So for sake of this video, we'll go ahead and leave it on. Gate weave. And this is going to be kind of like a adding a uh, like a handshake into the footage. So we'll add a little bit of jitter. Very subtle on the 35mm end. If you go to Super 8, back it off. That's kind of what you're looking at there. So it's not super noticeable, but you can see there's like slight jitters in. Again, not my thing, but it does have a purpose here and there. And then something really cool for intros and like little sequences is the overscan. 
So with overscanning, you get those matte boxes. And there's a wide variety of those from Super 8 to Standard 16 to 35 millimeter, Ultra 16 millimeter, and then you can go all the way up to like a Polaroid base and the Panavision. So the Panavision is going to kind of give you that widescreen look. Uh, you do have the option of kind of playing with these a little bit, rounding them off, neat sharp, the normal, which has like the slight rounded edges. You can also change the orientation of them. Change the perforation modes, lens zoom. So you do have a good bit of play with these. Uh, you can also make it, you know, scaled. So almost like adding typical matte boxes like you would if you're like running like 16 by 9 or something like that. Uh, there's also defocusing. So defo defocusing is going to allow for some of that rigidity on the outside and that play and movement. So it will give some of that like film look. And then you can flip it as well. Now flipping it on this isn't going to do anything because they're mirrored on both sides. So something cool for, you know, certain use cases. Definitely not using it on every single video. But um, I have used it for little like intro cuts and to... Uh, Kind of mimic like a, if I was shooting on Super 8. Uh, then you can also use your vignetting. So vignetting is going to do exactly what you would expect of it. It's going to add vignette. Uh, I don't typically add a lot of vignette into video, so... Not uh, super useful per se. But if you do want to draw focus onto like a subject that's centered in frame, I could see where it would be useful. So we're going to go ahead and finish up this one. I'll let this roll from start to finish with everything that we've done. And I have turned some of these back off just because I don't like the look of them. But you can see we've got that film breath in there, that little bit of pulsating. I do think we have like a nice grain. Uh, good look on the halation. It's not like too overdone, but you can see it in my eyes and kind of like on the rim. I think we've acquired a pretty good look with this. Now, as I stated before, can you get this with DaVinci? Absolutely. Does it take a little bit more work? Yeah. The streamlining in the workflow and being able to do everything like all in one node is the big selling point to me. It's a matter of if you think it's worth the cost. So the cost is $449, and there is a uh, discount code and you know, all that stuff with uh, commission for me, it's 10% off. So it will knock like $45 off of it. Uh, I do think the price is a little excessive when you're figuring that DaVinci Resolve by itself is only $300 and you're getting significantly more from the da da DaVinci Resolve Pro Mode or whatever you want to call it, Studio. So... It's up to you whether you think it's worth the cost or not. Now, I do want to reiterate that uh, Dehancer did reach out to me. They sent me an email, said that they liked my videos, and that they would like for me to go in and review the Dehancer. So I did receive the product for free for a month. Um, I actually asked for an extension on it because I've been so slammed with weddings. And I do think it's, you know, with me getting it for free, worth every penny. Would I go spend $450 on it? Uh, probably not, unless I had that extra money sitting around. Now, for photo, I would love it. And I do have the, the app, which I'll dig into kind of towards the end of this video and show you just what the app's capable of, because the app does some really cool stuff for photo that is uh, a little bit harder to achieve through things like Lightroom and, you know, especially if you're a mobile editor. I primarily edit on an iPad most of the time, so... I think having that app and being able to like do my color corrections and my look and everything and then export it, send it directly over to the Dehancer app and then add my bloom and halation and stuff like that. Super cool. Um, that to me is worth it. But let's go ahead and dig into this next clip since this was kind of portrait style and we'll uh, 
you know, see what else it's capable of. I get the money and it's right on cue. Keep the duffel bag up inside my coop. Hold a couple racks, tell them I love you. You want to be a boss, do it like I do. Uh, yeah. Get that money, I'm a flex. I get that money, I'm a flex. I get that money, I'm a flex. You now rocking with the best. All right, y'all, so real quick before we dive into clip number two, I just wanted to ask y'all to like and subscribe. Uh, it does help the channel grow, and it makes me feel good about myself. Also, if you were interested in downloading Dehancer, uh, we do have a affiliate link, or I guess like an affiliate code. So if you do go to Dehancer and go to your checkout, the code is going to be Graham Media. Uh, Graham like the cracker, media like media. Um, and that's going to get you 10% off, so it'll knock about 45 bucks off the total cost if this is something that you're interested in. So, real quick breakdown of clip number two. This is just uh, me walking through the trees into the sunset. Uh, this is also shot on the Black Magic, so I wanted to show kind of how versatile this uh, plug-in was in different applications with different cameras. So, first clip is shot on the Fujifilm. Uh, this clip's going to be shot on the Black Magic 6K full frame which is a lovely camera. Um, I'll be doing a review on that upcoming. I have a few that are in the pipeline, so keep an eye out for those. I plan on getting stuff dropping just about every week from here out. And let's go ahead and All right, so it. clip number two here, as I stated, uh, shot on the Blackmagic 6K full frame. We shot this in 50 frames per second, and we are exported in a, or we're working in a 24 frame per second timeline. So as you can see, it's a little bit slow mode. Um, don't mind my underboob sweat because it was 98 degrees that day and it's hot out here for a thick boy. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do, and the reason for this is uh, Dehancer doesn't quite have the 6K full frame on there. I don't know if it's too new of a thing, um, but it doesn't have the extended film looks and everything. So we are going to go into the Black Magic and convert this from, I shoot in uh, extended film look. So we're going to uh, convert from the cinema camera to the Rec. 709. And we're going to go version 2 on this just because it's a little bit warmer. Gives us a good base to work with. And then I'm going to do my first node, which is going to be a little bit of sharpening. And I usually tend to stick to 0.47 on the sharpening. Uh, drop the offset a little bit, add some contrast. Push the highlights up just a tid. And drop the shadows down just a hair. Uh, I'm going to push this a little bit warmer just because that's the look that I like and push some warmth into the mid-tones. And then we're going to adjust our curves. So I have a tendency to pretty much keep my curves the same for most applications, um, unless it calls for something else, of course. And we'll go in and adjust the global exposure up just a little bit. And I think that gives us a good base to work from. So from here, I'm going to add my node, go in, and add Dehancer on there. I don't know why we were scrolling. So as you can see, we're in the Rec. 709. I'm going to reset all of these to be disabled. Actually, I'm going to move you over here. We're running into some space issues on the... Uh, on the old desktop here. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to go in and disable all these. Um, I will say, and I haven't messed with this too much yet, so it's possible that you can turn this off, but it does save every setting from prior. So you do have to go in and re-click all of these. So first thing we're going to do, exposure compensation. I'm going to push up just a little bit more again. And we have a ton of grain in there. So let's take this grain off. It's a little bit too much grain for my liking. And I'm going to find a good midpoint here where I'm in focus. That looks good right about there. We got some of that sunset peeking through. 
uh, temperature compensation we're just gonna leave that alone because I've already pre-adjusted that and then first thing we'll do is uh, pick our film stock so I'm thinking like a Kodak gold might be good for something like this um, as I said I do tend to like lean into warmer and real quick I'm just gonna scroll through all these just so you have a chance to see them um, there's more than 60 different film emulations here that you can choose from uh, you're gonna probably get the most use out of the Fuji film and the Kodak ones uh, but I have used the Agfa um, I think the Agfa color 100 is one of the ones that I liked uh, I tend to use that more on my Dehancer app for photos but still an option here uh, so let's go down to let's start messing with the Kodak ones so there's Era Color, there's Color Plus, Eastman Double X, which is going to give a black and white, which we don't want to use because we got that nice little sunset in the background. Uh, the black and whites do look good on here, though. I will say that. Ektar. Ektar is one I lean into a little bit. Uh, this is like an expired one simulation. Uh, expired in 2017. Don't know if that really matters too much, but it is a little bit warmer than the base Ektar, uh, which tends to lean pretty blue. There's Ektar 25, expired 1996, Kodak Gold, and let's mess with these portraits a little bit. I'm really liking the way these portraits are looking. Oh, nope, that's the one. That's the one we're going with. We're going to go with Pro Image. So, in turn, um, because that did pull a little bit warm, we're going to drop our temperature back down just a little bit and push a little bit more warmth into the mid-tones only. So I think we've got a good base look right there. Now we're going to go in. You can play with the push-pull. Um, I do like kind of contrasty stuff, so I am going to up my contrast just a tidbit. That's currently unabled. Um, but we are going to enable it, and you'll see the difference there. And right there, um, just a huge, huge difference between like the flatness of just the Kodak Pro image and then go into the contrast boost. Uh, color separation, I leave it 100 pretty much all the time, but for sake of showing you, you can see it in the mid-tones there. Uh, color boost, don't get carried away with this. This is like just oversaturating everything. So I will knock this up a few ticks. We're just going to go to 10 for now. Uh, film compression, as we stated before, this is going to kind of help with your bloom and your highlights. Um, so it will bring your highlights down a little bit. I usually leave this one enabled. Uh, expand. This is going to change your black point and white point. So another way to add contrast, truly. Uh, I am going to pull my white point down a little bit just to brighten me up and then prints. This is the probably the second most important out of all of the uh, options that you have here. So there's on Fujifilm. Um, I think that would look good for kind of like action-y sequences, darker stuff, that kind of stuff. I really like the way the Kodak uh, 2383 print film looks. I like the way that the Endura Glossy looks also, but for this sake, we are gonna go with the 2383. Uh, kind of deepen those greens a little bit, added some depth to the color of my shirt there. Then you can go in and mess with the tonal contrast. Target white point. So this target white point is going to adjust more your white temperature. So as you can see, all the way to the right, blues it up a little bit. All the way to the left, makes it a little bit more gold. We'll go a little bit more left to accentuate that sunset. Color density. And that's just going to be how thick that color's laid on there. And then color head is not something I really mess with too much. Um, it does have its uses, but, you know, it is what it is. You can also gang them all together if you do want to, like, push into a little bit different color. I think this is going to be the better option. So for sake of uh, using it, we'll just leave it there. Shadow tones, this is going to be your... Um, color temperature in your shadows so I tend to like to lean a little bit blue in my shadows a little bit warm in my midtones 
And for sake of this, we're going to lean a little bit warm in the highlights as well. And then film grain. So it's easy to get carried away with the film grain pretty quickly too. Um, 65 is going to give you like the finest grain, whereas going down to 8 millimeter is going to give you the most intense grain. 35 seems to be a happy medium. For sake of me wanting this to be sharper, we're going to go with 65, 250 on this. So we'll get a nice, nice fine grain on it, and I'm going to blow it up so you guys can see it here. So it still preserves a lot of those textures and a lot of the sharpness without being too flat and too overly sharp. I'm going to drop this amount down just a little bit. And then halation. I love halation. So that pretty much goes on to everything to some extent for me. And where I want to see the halation is where all these highlights are up here in the top. So right now I think it's a little bit overdone. You can see like the no rem jet really blows it up even more. But 65 millimeter keeps it pretty controlled. So we're going to pull this highlight tone down just a little bit. Now that is pretty close to true and accurate color of what the sunset looked like. We get some pretty awesome sunsets there in the backyard and nice little golden hours. So I'm not going to do too much more than that. And then for the sake of the end result here, I am going to throw in some film damage just so you guys can see what that looks like. I think it kind of added to the look. Um, it is going to have its use cases, and it's not going to be used in every single thing, but it's pretty cool. Overscans, again, I'm not going to piss with too much because I just don't like them. Uh, intros, you know, quick little 30-second clip, something like that, to make it look like uh, it was shot on, like, a Super 8 or something. It's pretty cool, but it's cheaper <laughs> to just go buy a Super 8. So, maybe you might want to do that. Uh, and I am pretty happy with the end result here, so we're going to go ahead and export that one. And I'll show you my export settings, because why not? And what we're going to do here is export at 23.976. Um, I know it's not technically 4K, but it was shot in 6K, so I am going to leave it pretty high on the... Uh, Restricted kilobytes per second, add it to the render queue, and I'm going to throw that up now. Alright, so real quick before I close this all out, um, I do want to talk about Dehancer's uh, iOS app as well. So, I'm going to pull that up on the screen here, show you like just a quick little edit. Uh, I do really like this app, uh, especially for editing like JPEGs and stuff like that. Uh, I shoot on a Fujifilm quite a bit, and it's nice to add halation and bloom and stuff like that. Things that you can't really do in Lightroom. So I will say this is like a nice little effective tool of adding some character to your photos. Uh, this kind of outshined the Dehancer plugin to me. I feel like everything that on on Dehancer on DaVinci, uh, I could still achieve through DaVinci through some extra steps and processing and stuff like that. Uh, the film grain is very believable, and I think the, they they do film grain a lot better than DaVinci does. But. The photo editing app, um, I have it on iPhone. I get a lot of things out of that that I can't get out of Lightroom. Um, and things that I'm not really willing to go into Photoshop with. So, I will say I think that's in and of itself kind of worth it. Uh, I've been using it pretty much on all my edits for like my Instagram posts, some of my TikTok posts, that kind of stuff. And I really like the direction that I can take my photos with that. Shooting it... Um, in RAWs, just straight from my phone, I've used a few of those images. Uh, I've also used it, like I said, from film simulations that were JPEGs and added halation, bloom, that kind of stuff. 
So it's a pretty cool app. Uh, check it out. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one.